Well, well, it is 6 o'clock p.m. in Brooklyn, uh, and we just want to say welcome to this live. Uh, welcome to our, all our SSP families out there and their friends. Yes, your friends, because we asked you to bring on your friends, because tonight we are talking about Kawasaki disease, and uh, we're bringing on a specialist. Her name is Dr. Liliana Barrias Arias. Uh, she is a pediatric rheumatologist. She works at the Albany Medical Center. But before we bring her on, Dr. Cal has a few words for you. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> we're getting into our eighth week. I think a lot of us are hitting our wall, but I have to tell you, I'm so very inspired and uh, appreciative of New Yorkers, you know, some, some of you have ha been like four person households in 800 square foot apartments and um, and have not left other than to g do grocery shopping and to come to us. And I I think that this is the, t you know, they, people talk about like New Yorkers being, you know, being cr maybe crass and rude and selfish, but I think this this is showing what New Yorkers are and, this kind of sacrifice is an effort is heroic in itself. And I, I really appreciate everybody doing this. Um, so tonight's, uh, tonight's discussion is going to uh, be focused on um, the Kawasaki-like syndrome that is happening with, um, with uh, some association with COVID um, diagnoses. Um, firstly, I'd like to just uh, lay a little groundwork. <clears throat> um, Kawasaki uh, disease is not um, is not unknown to us. It's been around um, for years. It is a frequently common um, uh, uh, question on our pedi pediatrics boards um, every year. Uh, it is also um, it happens, we see it about once or twice a year um, where it happens where a cluster of kids get high fevers for five or six, um, five or six days, um, sometimes with these other symptoms, associated with these other symptoms like uh, swollen feet or hands, um, uh, a rash all over the body, some oral ulcers, really, um, really like red eyes without any, um, without any kind of uh, bacterial discharge. Um, uh, and then the kids are just very, also very super irritable. Um, so it's, and it generally follows, um, the, the, the thought is that it follows a viral infection or sometimes strep infection, um, four to 12 weeks after the initial insult. And, uh, what we believe is happening is that your body reacts to whatever entity is causing the insult and kicks it out of there. And then it starts, um, and then that reaction starts to fight its own body tissues. And a lot, and some of these body tissues um, include um, uh, vascular tissues in some quite important uh, um, blood vessels, uh, specifically the coronary arteries that lead to the heart. Um, what we're seeing in the current situation is not exactly what's going on, but has a very much a lot of overlap. So um, I'm not an expert. So I de we decided to get an expert um, on uh, with us. Online. Yeah. We, we figured okay. out what was going on. Hi, Lily. All right. Sorry, guys. Is that we have we? Oh my God! No worries, my God. Thank you so much. Yeah. So first of all, let's tell everybody how you guys know each other. Oh my I, God. I heard, I heard you talking a little bit. You know. Yeah, I said. I said. I said you. I was your senior resident for six months. Then you're attending for the remaining two and a half years, three and a half years that you were with us because you stayed on for chief, right? Yeah, well, to, you know, full three years, and then I was doing some uh, moonlighting in the NICU. And... Oh, that's right. That's right. And uh, and we became friends, and then you went on to do your uh, pediatric rheumatology um, fellowship at HSS, uh, world-renowned. Uh, people fly in from Europe to be seen there, um, so you're very well-trained. Um, 
And also, she used to play soccer with the men in Prospect Park and school them. So that's why. Yeah, until I, I, I injured my knee. Uh, <laughs> all right. So listen, um, yeah. we're, we, had you, we wanted to have you on here to clarify um, people are scared. We want to, and um, we want to know um, what they need to be scared about, what the numbers are potentially, and uh, knowing that you come from a um, place and successfully treated a kid with uh, this condition, um, uh, what are the things that we need to look out for, and uh, what do we look to if we eventually have a diagnosis of such? Yeah, so, you know, we started noticing, um, I would say, the beginning of March, we started seeing that we were having a lot of consults for Kawasaki disease, which, you know, we, as pediatric rheumatologists, we get consulted occasionally for some Kawasaki disease, especially if they have any atypical features. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we started noticing, I would say that probably from earlier, from February, around that time, we started seeing an increase in cases. And our particular institution, we saw in the past uh, eight weeks around um, 10 to 12 cases when the whole last year we just saw nine cases. So we started thinking that this was a little bit unusual when, and then the UK uh, brought the alert two weeks ago about uh, them seeing also a cluster of patients that look similar to Kawasaki, but some of them were getting uh, very sick, which we, we did have one case like that that fit that description. Um, so far, you know, right now they're calling this whole, this new end, it has a new name, right? It's mm -hmm. believed to be a little bit different than Kawasaki, mm -hmm. and it's called uh, the Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there are similarities for sure to Kawasaki in the sense that they, they both have high fevers that are prolonged. Uh, and they have, uh, a lot of them will have red eyes, right? They present with conjunctivitis. Uh, a, a lot of them, uh, what we're seeing is also um, rash, right? Multiforming, just like we know with Kawasaki, any type of rash could be, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a particular type of rash. Uh, we've had some with very extensive rash. Uh, a lot of, uh, one of the features that we're seeing in common with a lot of these kids, they get swelling of the hands and feet, which we see in Kawasaki also. Um, the only things that are a little bit atypical, one is the age. We're starting to see some older patients, right? Uh, the other thing is, of course, they, that some of them present already very sick, very quickly, right? They're, they're going into shock. Uh, but not all of them. You know, I would say that at least in our experience, a lot of these patients are relatively stable. They look like a Kawasaki. The good thing is a lot of the ones that are stable are responding to IVIG just mm -hmm. like Kawasaki. Okay. Um, the one that we had that was uh, very ill had features of a complication that we commonly see in um, some patients in pediatric rheumatology that is called macrophage activation syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. And this is very similar to, it is a type of cytokine storm, which they have seen in adults. And uh, this particular patient we saw at that moment, we thought it was a Kawasaki complicating with a, a, a uh, macrophage activation syndrome. So we treat it as that and it did very well. So I think that one, one thing that we need to be alert is that these kids can have features of this complication and this complication is treated dif differently, right? And that's why I think it's gonna, there has to be involvement of pediatric rheumatology in a lot of these cases, as well as hematology. Uh, so we need a more multi, multi, um, uh, how do you say, a multi-group um, of doctors, uh, a team of doctors right. treating them. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And just to reiterate what you said, um, 
this is happening like Kawasaki's normally is like a three to five or six or seven crowd. What we're seeing here is this is hitting more of the five to 10 or 12 year old crowd. Is that correct? Yeah, we're seeing some older patients. Okay. And Up to 20, you know, today the criteria of the Department of Health came out. They did mm -hmm. their own criteria already. Uh -huh. And they're saying any individual less than 21. So I've talked to some of my colleagues. They definitely have seen older patients that are meeting this description, which is not coming to see Kawasaki and older uh, children, right? So they've, they've seen 19 years old. I had one colleague talking to me about a 19-year-old this right. week. Uh, and, you know, so a lot of older kids. Okay. All right. And, um, it, you know, what, we're, what we learned and what we're um, told to, uh, about Kawasaki was that, and this is my take, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, that, mm -hmm. you know, parents are afraid, are, are concerned that maybe they're letting something slide under the radar. But my take is that this is not going to slide under the radar for you. Kids with Kawasaki are sick. They're irritable. They don't want to be, they don't want to be touched. It's almost, you know, it's, it's almost like 70 to 75% of being like um, meningitic. Is that correct? Am I wrong? Correct. Yeah, no, you're correct. I think these okay. are kids that you're gonna, the parents who are gonna be concerned, they're not looking well. Right. Uh, especially the ones that are getting sicker, it's, they're gonna notice definitely that, you know, okay. this is not just a re regular little rash or anything like that. Correct, correct, okay. And then, so just going, just from a, ge um, a general peds point of view for this, mm -hmm. um, it's allergy season which brings mm -hmm. the upper respiratory stuff, which brings the red eyes, which brings mm -hmm. some rashes. We're not going mm -hmm. out and getting vitamin D and sunshine. So we're gonna see eczematous rashes. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend as things to look for to be brought to medical attention? I think the number one thing is fever, right? Mm -hmm. Fever, okay. these patients, all of them are gonna have fever. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say they're gonna have probably a fever above 101, 102. Um, so that's gonna be the first thing. And any fever that is, is going on for a few days should already start uh, hinting a concern. You know, we always say Kawasaki five days of fever, right? To make the diagnosis. But uh, I would say these kids are probably getting a little sicker before the, that fifth day of fever. So okay. you're gonna be around. Um, and then the rashes that we're seeing are more generalized, I would say, than just an eczema type of rash, you know. Right. Um, but in general, like you said, these kids are gonna probably be irritable. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, the other feature that is being noticed with um, this case is that it's a little bit not the typical thing we see with Kawasaki is there's a lot of GI complaints. Yes, right. So, uh, but, um, you know, but that we, we can see in Kawasaki. But in general, I think these kids are going to be uncomfortable. They're, they're not going to look happy. Right. For sure. Okay. Okay. Very okay. So we're going to start taking some uh, uh, questions from the viewers. Is that okay? Sure. All right. So first one is, uh, Trisha is asking, can a three-month-old get Kawasaki disease? So it is very rare to see it in, in infants, but it's possible. But it's, it's extremely rare. We definitely have not had any, any case at around that age. Uh, in, in, you know, I have never seen a, a Kawasaki older than six months. And it's, so in general, less than a year of age is rare to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, and I think we, we touched base on this a little bit because we talked about England, uh, but a viewer is asking, why haven't we heard about this from other parts of the world with large COVID spread? Or have we? Is it all brand new sounding? So we, we have, right? Actually, um, the Ita an Italian group of doctors uh, published yesterday a study in the Lancet. It just that just came out. 
I was hoping to read it before I came here, but unfortunately, I was working today, and I, my drive is an hour and, a, and an hour and 15 minutes, so that's part of why I was rushing here. But this study came out of an, it's an outbreak of Kawasaki disease in Italy. So Italy has reported uh, definitely uh, the UK. Um, they, they, I, we haven't heard much from France, but I heard that they, they also reported they, cases. They just had a, yeah, they just put out a study too. Yeah. Yeah. We have not heard, you know, it seems like it did not happen in China. It was not reported in China and Japan, which is interesting, right? Because Kawasaki, uh, the genetics of Kawasaki usually affects Asian yeah. uh, individuals. So this one is different. And some thoughts are that there's a thought that the, the European strain yes. of, of COVID is different than the strain that was seen in China. So that's a possibility. Um, you know, the patients we've seen in our, in our group have been majority Caucasians. Uh, we ha did have African-American, but the UK did seem an increased uh, in African American, well, African descendants in UK. So um, we don't know. I, we, we believe there's probably something to do with genetics, but we're not sure. Thank you. Uh, Becky is asking My two and four year old daughters were sick with COVID like symptoms back in early February. They have not been tested or confirmed. Um, should it, should I be on the lookout for Kawasaki disease now since they were sick in February? Well, um, that's a good question, right? We, we don't know. It, Kawasaki, it seems at least the cases that we have, we believe that they are presenting after the infection happened, right? We don't know how many weeks after. Um, we in our group of patients, we, we're not getting po even positive antibodies yet. So we don't know if it's because we're me me measuring the IgG, which is like a little older antibodies where it, like those maybe are gonna come out later than this. And right now we could see IgM, but we're not, we don't have the ability to measure the IgM in, at least in our institution. So, uh, uh, we don't know, but we do believe it's a late response to the infection. So it could be possible. I wouldn't necessarily be super concerned because, again, we're talking there's an increase in cases, but this is still quite rare for the amount of kids that might have been exposed. So, um, but yeah, the, the belief is this, this is happening weeks after the infection. It's not happening necessarily with the infection. Got it. Uh, Sophia is asking, at one point, is it necessary to go to the ER? What symptoms are significant enough to determine to go in? Um, you know, I would say it's severe irritability, uh, the fe high fever for more than three days. Uh, any sign that you feel your child, you know, your child is not eating, uh, it, it, it's looking very... Uh, weak or, or pale, you know, I, I think we have to err for caution and, and take them, you know, either to the pediatrician or, or to the ER. Thank you. Um, should a child who was treated for Kawasaki this year be tested for COVID antibodies? Um, you know, it's a uh, it's an interesting question, and I think it will be helpful eventually to have that information. I, I'm just concerned that we still don't have the, the right test for the antibodies. We just, you know, we do have them out there, but we're, I'm not sure they're reliable yet. So I don't know that if, if it's not going to give us too much information yet, you know, having to speak to, to expand, you know, your money in this and it might not be accurate, you know. So I don't know that I would rush now, but I think at certain point, once we feel that we have better testing, um, I think it would be a good idea to, to test these patients and know if this was the, what triggered the Kawasaki, you know. Mm -hmm. Remember that Kawasaki has happened for years, right? We, we know. 
But until the, today, we don't know what is exactly the trigger of Kawasaki. Um, I think we have probably different things that could trigger it. But after this COVID-19 infection, I think we're going to learn a lot about this disease, you know. Yeah. Um, the next question is, is it, is it treatable? Does it become a lifelong issue? So, so far, it seems that the, the, it's treatable. The patients are responding well to the, to the treatments that we know of, of right now. Different than most typical Kawasaki's, e even though some of these kids present heart complications like myocarditis, they're not necessarily doing the same aneurysms that we have seen in Kawasaki. So, so far there's no indications that once they pass this acute process, they're gonna have anything uh, long-term. But I think that's gonna, it's gonna take time to know that, right? Because we're just starting and uh, we even believe this is a different entity. You know, we're still calling it Kawasaki, but we think it's probably gonna be a, com a com not complete, but a different um, spectrum maybe of the disease or something. Right. You know. you're, 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 you're treating successfully with like IVIG and other anti-inflammatories. Um, Correct. Are you also putting them on um, low dose uh, aspirin afterwards or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. So, and then, I just wanted to piggyback on the other question um, of is it treatable? Is it contagious? Well, no, right? The Kawasaki itself is not contagious. So this is mm -hmm. the this is the response of the body to an old infection, right? Mm -hmm. So the infection was infection, you know, contagious at the moment that this child had it. If they had it, right? We still not even we have not confirmed that all these kids have antibodies, you know. Right. So um, we just see an increase in incidence enough that that is setting this alarm, but we still we don't have enough data to know. But, but definitely the moment they have the Kawasaki is not contagious. So this answers all these questions that I see here in the comments about kids returning possibly to daycare or school. So I guess the parents are we're concerned about, is it contagious? So I guess this answers that question, well, right? No, it's, no, they're asking about returning regarding possible getting COVID and and having th this as a consequence no. they're not they're not asking if you go can you catch kawasaki right i'm guessing okay so if they if after they have kawasaki are they fine to go back to school is that the question like would they be strong enough or is that the question or i i thought that they were asking about is, is it contagious meaning if if my kid goes back to school, can they catch Kawasaki? There, I think. I think the question is people more being um, anxious and nervous about sending their kids back to school, if um, if and when we do it in New York City um, and in. Uh, Sorry, my bad. <laughs> and in in daycare. Um, yeah, you my, know, I, I right, think so my uh, understanding. You're right. That yes. guy's right. My my take is that this is so very rare even though Kawas um even though covid is very ubiquitous this is a rare consequence it's treatable um i i think getting covid and transmitting it to a susceptible individual is more of a concern to me at this point as far as um as far as returning to school and daycare am am i wrong no no i would say exactly the same this is rare we should you know it, it, it we should not be alarmed it, it should not stop us you know i think once the 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 city feels ready that we either have controlled the outbreak or we're ready to take in the influx of patients uh, if there was increased cases i still feel children in general are doing better in, in this pandemic in general. And, and, I, and I feel that even if we find that we're going to see a little more of these cases, so far they're treatable. They're still doing well. You know, maybe it's going to be, uh, it's good to be aware of it. So yes, if we not, not stay home with prolonged fever and your child not looking well, that's the moment to say, okay, I'll go to the hospital. I know a lot of people are afraid of going to an ER 
because they don't want the kid to get infected there. But at, at this moment, I think that, that that will be my only recommendation is to not be afraid to seek attention because this is treatable and they can do well, you know. Okay. okay. And just following up with that, um, are there any um, uh, underlying conditions that predispose to getting the inflammatory syndrome with uh, COVID? No, right, we don't know. You know, they spoke, today there was a meeting of the Department of Health talking about it, you know, if, if we were seeing the same risk factors that we see in adults getting sicker with COVID, do we see those risk factors in children? And we're still too early to know, right? Uh, they reported that they had seen a few more cases, uh, you know, of obese children, but it still has not been. So it seems in general that we we won't know that. It's okay. uh, maybe that, you know, all, all these cases that get sicker, even in the adult world, might have some genetic reason they're doing this. Maybe a way that they fight the virus or something is not working that great in them and they, they they do this type of uh, hyperinflammation that we are seeing in, in the adults also that I think is uh, a, a very important part of why they are deteriorating like they are, right? Yeah. But, um, but it will take us a while to try to figure that. We, remember, we still haven't figured Kawasaki disease and Kawasaki right. disease has been out for years, you know? So it's gonna be tough. Yeah. So just a, a couple more questions, if you have a, a couple of minutes. Uh, our community is very eager to know a couple of things. One is that what went wrong, and I don't know if you know, or I don't know if we all, anybody knows, but what went wrong with the children who re recently passed away? Do we know? No, I don't know. I don't know details, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, maybe no. they did, maybe these children did have some form of, predisposition, you know, like some form of other underlying condition that made them harder for them to fight this. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we still have not got details about that. And the last question that we're going to take from the community is, uh, and I don't know if we covered it, I, maybe we did, but let's ask again, maybe. What is the treatment for this new syndrome? Is there one? Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, right now, we are following the treatment of Kawasaki. So even though the disease has a new name and it's been described differently, I think that the, there's so many similar features to Kawasaki that we're gonna try to treat it the same way, which is a, a quite benign treatment, right? Because IBIG, they, they give you the antibodies of, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This, I don't even know how where it is. <laughs> that must be my husband's not phone somehow clicking here. I don't know. Don't oh worry. God. Don't worry. Let it ring. We can hear you. It's don't worry. Fine. Anyways, so um so uh so they're using the same treatment. So the IVAG, which um it, we use for Kawasaki is is basically a pool of antibodies of other individuals helping you fight these other antibodies that are coming to attack you. Right. So, so far, the kids who have received this seem to do well on it. So I think that's still gonna be the treatment, the first approach. If the kids are looking like they're having more inflammatory response, uh, then that's where we are doing steroids. So that's a little bit different to what adults are doing, right? Uh, we are definitely doing it. And there's other medications that we're using because we're trying to treat that, that cytokine storm that is happening in children. And I think this is going to be an important uh, learning experience for the management of the adults with this condition, because I do believe that um, a lot of the complications in the adult world is B is due to this cytokine storm also. Um, but in children, because we are actually, we see this happening more in, their, in children, we're more familiar to how to manage this. In the cases that you um, were managing, did you guys have to use inotropes and other cardiac um, yes. medications? You did? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
the, the children that have been very sick, they need to be in the ICU. Yeah. And, um, but we had many that were not that sick that we were able to manage in the floor with IVIG and maybe a little bit of prednisone that we didn't have to give them even high doses of prednisone. So. Okay. All right. Before we let you go, I think it would be a good idea to summarize what the symptoms are. Okay. Right. What do you okay. think? Can we do that? Sure. All right. I can, I can tell you, I will. So we very official summary. I'll tell you what the clinical criteria of what the Department of Health published uh, this week. Okay, so any individual less than 21 years of age who has a minimum of one day history of, of fever, uh, that they are, it can be as, as high, you know, as low as 100.4, so 38 degrees and requires hospitalization, right? So they're already looking a little bit more ill. That presents with one of the following. So they're gonna have either, um, some of these are gonna have features of, of, of low blood pressure and shock, right? But the, the things that we can see physically are gonna be the macular, papular rash. So a rash that can, can look red, can look any form usually more generalized than, than just like an eczema that might be just on your arms, right? Or, um, they have a bilateral conjunctivitis, non-purulent conjunctivitis, and they have signs of uh, muc uh, mucocutaneous involvement. So some of them are gonna have the red uh, the tongue with strawberry tongue, swollen lips or red lips, and the swelling of the hands and feet are very characteristic to see. And they might have uh, GI symptoms, including diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. So that's what they use as the criteria for the diagnosis, uh, which is similar to the criteria we see in Kawasaki, right? Kawasaki disease, we talk, and I have my criteria here. Kawasaki disease, we say it's a five days of fever at least, plus sometimes, again, conjunctivitis, red eyes, red, red, red red lips, uh, red tongue, a lymphadenopathy, but those are like a little more nonspecific, but the rash also. So okay. clinically, they look very similar, you know. Okay. So let's say a kid has fever for one day and a rash and is still relatively stable, feeding fine, making good urine, um, not visibly working to breathe or not extremely irritable what would you say to do in that situation? Would you go in to be checked or would you observe at home? Um, well, if we're just having a, a mild uh, rash, right? That, that no, no redness of the eyes yet mm -hmm. and nothing right. in the tongue, maybe you could observe a little bit at home, right? If they're feeling well. But I, I think if we start seeing redness of the eyes or some, you know, I, I would err a little bit to be on the safe side and, okay. and have, or you could even have a, a first set of labs, right? So, some blood work to see if we're showing very increased inflammation, right. which would be, I would definitely check for a CRP and ESR on these patients and then maybe consider a ferritin level on them. Okay. If, the, if those numbers are really high, then I would be a little more concerned. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liliana Barillas Arias. It was amazing to have you. I know that our community understands now why we love you so much. Oh, I miss you guys. I we miss, you, miss too. you too. Stay safe. Thank you so yeah. much. And everybody home, all our SSP families and friends, thank you so much for watching. We hope that this helped a little bit today. Um, we're going to post this again, uh, so don't worry if you missed a little bit, it's going to be on our social media. Thank you again, Dr. Liliana Barrias Arias. Bye, Lily. Love, Love you. you. Let me, let me uh, send you guys a huge hug. Uh, I think of you and all uh, the children of New York City all the time. I love New York. I love Brooklyn. And uh, they're very lucky to have you guys there. And uh, it's... Uh, you know, we have you in our hearts, sending you all our best wishes from here. Okay, guys? Love you. Thank you for saving children. We're so happy.
Thank you. We're so and, proud. And thank you for Bye. sharing with us. Thank you, guys. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye.